I'm Dave Batty, your narrator on a photographic trip through the highlights of the 50-year history of my hometown, the mill town of Snoqualmie Falls, Washington. This town had its own store, barber shop, railroad depot, post office, community hall, grade school, 50-bed hospital, and 250 homes surrounding the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company mill, which began production on November 25, 1917, as the second all-electric mill in the nation. Warehouser bought their timberland in the Snoqualmie Valley from Northern Pacific Railroad interests on January 3, 1900. It was checkerboarded with Rockefeller timber holdings. The Grandin Coast Lumber Company, spurred by 30-year-old Oliver David Fisher, bought the Rockefeller holdings in 1906. O.D. Fisher and George Long, a warehouser, decided in 1914 that it was time to merge interests form the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company, and build a mill and associated town for the workers. W.W. W. Warren was selected to manage the creation of the mill and town of Snoqualmie Falls. Valley pioneer Dio Reinig said of Warren, he was one of the finest men who ever came to the valley, loved by all who knew him. It took two years, from 1914 to 1916, to plan the construction details of the second all-electric mill in America. And then the project began. The mill site was cleared and timber on the mill pond was cut to enhance airflow in the mill yard where lumber would be stacked to dry. The machine shop, located near the mill pond between the sites for mill number one and mill number two, was built first, and the balance of the physical plant quickly followed. The mill pond, known as Lake Borst, was created by enhancing an ancient Snoqualmie River oxbow. The Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad skirted the eastern edge of the mill site, and the Northern Pacific built a railroad bridge over the Snoqualmie River to serve the new facility. The town of Snoqualmie Falls began with shelter to house mill construction workers. First came the boarding house on the hill above the mill, which later housed single mill workers. In time, a hotel annex was added just south of the boarding house. In June of 1916, the first 10 cottages in the Stringtown neighborhood were built on low land behind the mill to the north. Construction of houses continued, and the final count of Stringtown neighborhood homes was 18. Another small neighborhood formed on higher land east of Stringtown, which was known as the Flats. These were the very first homes in the town of Snoqualmie Falls. As mill construction moved forward, focus turned to the woods, and in April of 1917, logging Camp A opened in the area we now call Tokel. Mobile bunkhouses built on railroad cars made up the bulk of the camp, although permanent structures were also present. Loggers rode the train to camp on Monday mornings and returned to the mill by train after working on Saturday. The eight-hour day and five-day work week were still in the future. In the fall of 1917, mill number one, with its giant bandsaw or head rig, was almost ready to begin operation. Finally, on the 25th of November, the first cut was made by head sawyer Jack McBain, here shown much later, cutting a 10-foot, 6-inch Douglas fir log on the 11-foot saw. The first products shipped were airplane stock and ship's timbers. Wood had been designated a primary strategic material for the war. Hard hit by World War I Armed Forces resource requirements, Warren and Long were building and attempting to staff a mill with a dwindling workforce. One solution was to hire women for traditionally male jobs, a radical idea for the time, but backed by W.W. W. Warren, 
who later introduced female secretaries to the traditionally all-male mill office. Another resource option was Japanese labor. The Stokwami Falls Japanese community consisted of eight bunkhouses built along the Mill Pond Road back of the railroad tracks north of the Northern Pacific Railroad Bridge near Mill 2. This community provided schooling for the children in traditional Japanese culture as well as public school attendance and Japanese workers later made the transition from the railroad building to mill work. The residents of the Snoqualmie Falls Japanese community were interned by the U.S. government in 1942. The most unusual solution to the unavailability of workers was the U.S. Army Spruce Production Board, which came to the rescue in January of 1918. The Valley Straight Clear Sitka Spruce and Douglas Fir were the primary material needed to build airplanes. For soldiers, Working in the Miller Woods was preferable to being shot at in France. Woods boss Cutler Lewis was sent to nearby camps to choose recruits with previous woods or mill experience. Town expansion was fast, especially in 1917, beginning with about a dozen craftsman-style bungalows constructed in the Gulch neighborhood on the Loop Road from the community hall and grade school down to the mill store. Then, in the summer of 1917, came the dozen homes of the Terrace neighborhood, built on the upper side of what is now 396th Drive, across from the Snoqualmie Falls Grade School, on the way to Highland Drive. The large company store and integrated post office opened for business in the fall of 1917. Here folks charged groceries without signing for them, ate lunch on the broad steps, bought defense stamps at the post office and gasoline at the only pump in town. Managed in later years by Bill Ronick, the new store replaced a temporary facility opened in Stringtown during mill construction. The construction spree of 1917 was finalized in September when the 12 homes known as The Point and nicknamed the Dirty Dozen because of their proximity to ash and cinders falling from mill number one stack and burner were completed. The second Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company logging camp, Camp B, opened on the old Fuller Farm in March of 1918 and was initially manned by the U.S. Army, as was second shift for mill one where approximately 60 out of the 100 person crew were U.S. Army personnel. The Army also helped staff Mill 2 equipped with a smaller head rig engineered to cut hemlock and western red cedar. It began operation on May 24, 1918. The shingle mill attached to Mill 2 became operational on June 7th and was soon turning out 500,000 shingles a day. The first of three community hall buildings was built with 4L, or Loyal Legion of Loggers and Lumbermen Volunteers in 1918. Tradition states that there was a timekeeper among the volunteers and that the company kept track of time and paid them for their contributions to the community. The building wasn't pretty. It was structured just like a bunkhouse, but it almost immediately assumed its role as the heart of the community. In November of 1917, Captain George W. Gove, one of the original 1882 partners in the Hop Ranch, that flourished until the turn of the century on Meadowbrook Farm, sold his estate on the Snoqualmie River to the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company, providing the land that in 1918 would become the 30-home Riverside community on what we now know as Reinig Road. At the same time, the 13-home upper portion of the Riverside community on what is now known as 396th Drive was added to the growing town. The adjacent 18-home community of Railroad Avenue was also completed in 1918. The Orchard neighborhood, begun in 1919, was originally a social experiment to attract stable loggers with families, just as the other homes in Snoqualmie Falls were built to attract stable mill workers with families. 
and to break the long-standing stereotype that painted loggers as hard-drinking, irresponsible drifters. It worked. Although by the time the last of about 95 orchard neighborhood homes were completed in 1923, logging and mill families were mixed within all mill housing. Completed in the fall of 1920 at the insistence of mill manager Warren, the 50 bed Snoqualmie Falls Hospital and staff had an outstanding reputation for saving those involved in mill and logging accidents. But more than that, the facility became the hospital for the entire valley and the birthplace of hundreds of residents. The most admired doctor, Dr. Burke, a previous mayor of North Bend, moved his practice to the mill facility from the valley's first hospital in William Henry Taylor's house in North Bend. Dr. Burke was memorialized in bronze by individual $1 contributions from local citizens after his untimely death in 1928. Completed in 1920, the mill manager's house, like many at Snoqualmie Falls, was named after a family. In this case, it was the family of E.H. O'Neill, mill manager from 1929 until 1957. Perhaps the last house built in the town of Snoqualmie Falls, the Fisher House, named after the David and Dorothy Fisher family, was constructed in 1924 on the hill to the right of the O'Neill House. The grade school facility built by the school district on donated land serves Snoqualmie Falls and surrounding communities from the fall of 1922 until the spring of 1968 and holds fond memories for thousands of young people. Mariko Segamoto donated the flowering cherry trees on either side of the entrance when she graduated from the eighth grade in 1934. They still bloom each spring in the managed forest that replaced the town. Miller Stewart, the grade school principal for many years, is shown here with one of his classes. His family has donated 90 photographs, including these class pictures, to the reunion and the museum. Can you find yourself among the children of the mill? A relative? A neighbor? Just above the school playground on the hill containing the terrace neighborhood were the water tanks filled with cool, fresh water pumped from Tokel Creek. Let's reminisce about a few of the many milestones in the Snoqualmie Falls woods, mill, and town. We'll start with electric donkey engines, which were a dream of W.W. W. Warren, a dream he never saw fully operational due to his untimely death just before there was full-scale adoption in 1921. This engineering marvel, born at Snoqualmie Falls, required bringing electricity into the woods from the mill powerhouse located adjacent to the smokestack at Mill One. But it drastically reduced the woods fires created by cinders from wood, coal, or even oil-fired donkey engines. Power, safety, speed, and log handling were greatly improved over steam. On July 26, 1924, a beautiful new community hall facility was dedicated, and George Borden was appointed YMCA director. The facility was open to all and provided training and sports opportunities for the entire Upper Snoqualmie Valley. In 1925, the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company announced a revolutionary new policy in Pacific Northwest forestry. They would curtail the selling of logged off lands as stump farms, retain their timber lands, and manage them as forestry plantations under a perpetual yield philosophy. 
This led to the first local seedling nursery in 1938, where pheasants were also raised for release in the valley, and in 1943, designation as the sixth certified tree farm in the nation. Sycamore trees provided by the company were planted in front of the mill houses in the Riverside neighborhood about 1925. This grove along Reinig Road is now designated as a living King County landmark. Tragically, the second community hall was consumed by fire in January of 1930. It was immediately rebuilt into the outstanding facility that most of us knew and loved. These three were the very first log trucks purchased by the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company in 1937 and replaced contract trucks used in 1936. There was no power steering and marginal brakes. These trucks didn't travel to the mill but took the place of temporary railroad spurs built into the forest. Later, the efficiencies gained by running trucks all the way from the woods to the mill were realized, and trucks became the primary carrier of logs. In the beginning, the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company's oil-fired steam logging railroad was the king of the forest and beautiful to watch in operation. At peak, there were six engines in service. Numbers one and two were regular rod engines used in the woods. Number three was a Climax with gears in the center. Number four was a Shea with side pistons. Number five was used on the main line and number six had the water jacket mounted over the boiler. As trucks took the place of the spur tracks into the forest, an efficient and fast transfer of logs from the early logging trucks to the train for conveyance to the mill was essential, and a package transfer system using spar poles was engineered at Snoqualmie Falls in 1937 that could transfer a full load from a truck to a rail car in two minutes. It soon became obvious that the trucks could replace the elegant but expensive logging railroad and by 1941 the Snoqualmie Falls Logging Railroad was history. It was finally dismantled in 1944 along with the rectangular roundhouse in this picture. After years of using long crosscut saws or misery whips, chainsaws were introduced to the woods in 1939. They were driven by an electrical generator, were not well insulated, and often shocked the operators. Chain oil applied by hand was engine oil recycled from the logging trucks one logger said, the bull buck knew how much work you did by how dirty your face was. Titan brand gasoline chainsaws finally came to the woods in 1943. Production increased dramatically in the late 30s and early 40s as the Snoqualmie Falls Mill supplied material to war-ravaged Europe. Then the United States entered the war and many of our workers in both the woods and the mill volunteered or were drafted into the armed forces. Women stepped in, as they had in World War I, but to a much greater degree. In 1942, when YMCA Community Hall Director George Borden's son was killed in the war, George resigned and was replaced by Harold Keller. Harold's dedication, professionalism, and care helped Valley parents raise two generations of children and provided fatherly guidance for those whose genetic fathers were involved in the war effort. Harold was also an excellent photographer, responsible for most of the images in this video. In honor of the children of the mill, we share here some of Mr. Keller's photos 
depicting the diversity of sports, classes, training, and entertainment available to young people at the Snoqualmie Falls Community Hall, the heart of the town. Written and edited by Art Benson, with photographs supplied by Harold Keller, the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company's World War II newsletter to Armed Forces personnel from the Valley kept our troops abreast of the home front. Cheesecake photos, including these, were periodically sent with the newsletter to raise morale, and according to many letters from the front, were deeply appreciated. A second powerhouse stack made of concrete and 16 feet in diameter at the base was added in 1944. As wood byproducts created markets for the previous waste material, the sawdust burners for both mills were toppled in 1946. These major and easily identifiable physical changes helped date photographs of the mill. Additional uses for wood pulp generated the opening of the Silva Cell plant in 1952. Over the years, the homes in the mill town of Snoqualmie Falls were high graded and the least desirable of them were sold and moved elsewhere in the valley. As the need for employee homes close to the mill decreased and more employees preferred equity in their own homes, more domiciles were sold. Finally, in 1958, the bulk of the remaining homes were sold to individuals who moved them over a temporary bridge into Snoqualmie, where most of them still serve the community as part of the Williams addition. But even as the town disbanded, the mill grew, and in August of 1959, the largest ever edition of the Snoqualmie Valley Record proudly announced the opening of the new plywood plant. Construction began in December of 1958 and was completed in six months. 205 men were employed in the construction using timbers cut at Mill 1 and laminated Douglas fir beams from Longview. Gradually, other community facilities, once based in the town of Snoqualmie Falls, moved elsewhere in the valley. The patient pictured here is being moved from the Snoqualmie Falls Hospital to the new Nelms facility in 1948. The grade school closed in 1968 and the community hall in 1971. The post office served into the zip code era. The final date on the hand cancellation stamp for the Snoqualmie Falls, Washington 98066 Post Office was June 30th, 1971. Children of the Mill by Harley Brumbaugh. I come to sit in dappled shade while lingering on the hill to gather sounds once made by children of the mill. Children of the Mill you patriots of distant war, marbles bulging pockets, still you play for more. Classroom cozy drones the humming mill, sprinkling cedar aroma through speckled windowsill. Desk-bound dreamers with singing hearts at play, facing blanks and spaces, 
filled by close of day. Here was once a schoolyard teeming with youthful bliss. Here a slingshot schoolboy stole a jump rope kiss. Gone the cresting voices from the school upon the hill. Here you are among them, the children of the mill. Added now for your enjoyment are a cross-section of photographs of Snoqualmie Falls Community Hall adult programs, followed by mill photos and woods photos. Enjoy. <laughs> 